still working on me and make me what I ought to be. Hmm. Ephesians chapter 3. Hmm. I'm going to read. I might just, this is the first, first lesson in Ephesians 3. I may just read the entire thing. It's not a lengthy passage anyway. And um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Father, thank you for the privilege to read this portion of Scripture this afternoon. Thank you for the good day that we've had today at the Lord's house. We certainly have enjoyed our time together. I have enjoyed the service this morning and the fellowship and the singing. And certainly enjoyed our prayer time together and the meal together this afternoon. And certainly did stir our hearts and bless us to hear the children sing with such enthusiasm about a desire to do something for the Lord. They, they were telling me earlier even uh, at the lunch table, how excited they were about singing. Some of them were telling me, I'm thankful, Lord, they have a desire in their heart to sing about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible, and thank you for this opportunity to proclaim it. I pray you to help us, Lord. We sure need your help now, in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the, the book of Ephesians I mentioned way back in the introduction a long time ago, that this is the book of Ephesians is divided primarily in two parts, doctrinal and practical. In chapter 3, this is the final chapter as far as the doctrinal section of this epistle. We have learned that the church is a body and that the church is a temple. Now we'll learn from this passage of Scripture that the church is a mystery. Now I want you to understand that the word mystery bears no resemblance to the modern understanding of of what we would think about or what you might think about as far as a mystery. We would uh, think about who done it or who did it or whatever that might be. Uh, this is a, a mystery is something that had not previously been revealed and is currently made manifest or is currently made known. 
In this present chapter here, in Ephesians chapter number 3, we no longer are thinking in terms of a body. We're now thinking in terms of a building. A building which is considered or could be thought of as the mystical body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a body, it is a, it is a body uh, in the New Testament that is formed by the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to wash away our sin by the indwelling Spirit of God that lives in the heart of every single believer that's placed their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus. And so this, this body, this building, it is made up of Jews and Gentiles. It is made up of the rich and poor. It is made up of the bond and free. It is made up of anyone and everyone who will trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and be born again. And so in chapter 2, in chapter 2, we had our position in Christ. It was the phrase, ye in me. Here in chapter number 3, we have our possession of Christ, and that is I in you. I'm glad that I am in Christ, and I'm glad that Christ is in me. We see this truth set forth in John chapter 15. Hold your place here and come to John chapter 15 for just a moment. Talking about... Our position in Christ, we're in Him. Our possession of Christ, He is in us. Look what the Bible says in John chapter 15. Notice what Jesus said about the branches and the vine. Verse number 5, just for sake of time. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. You see that truth? The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And so we understand that Jesus is the vine. We believers, we that have been born again, we are the branches. And so in the vine, the branches have the ability to bear fruit. We cannot produce fruit of our own. And I want you to also notice that the vine does not produce fruit without the branches. He is the vine. We are the branches. And I, and he said in, in the verse, he abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, and without me, you can do nothing. And so it is true that the branch, the branches are to bring forth fruit, but in order for the branches to bring forth fruit, we must be connected to the vine. That is the message of I in you, or, or he abideth in me, and I in in him. And so I'm glad that we have not only this position in Christ, but we have this possession of Christ as well. Now come back to Ephesians chapter 3 and we'll look at a couple of things. Ephesians chapter 3, we see first of all in the first two verses, we see the minister of the church. Now we'll probably go through this chapter maybe a couple of times and look at different things as we go through the chapter. But we see first of all, we'll look at the minister of the church. And, of course, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you were. Now, first of all, the first three words of the verse, he said, For this cause. So the cause here that Paul is speaking of is the one body made up of the Jew and the Gentile Mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2, we mentioned it this morning at the end of the verse. It's talking about we're building together for an habitation of God. And so this cause that Paul is speaking of is this one body, these believers that are in Christ Jesus. Now, the first thing we want to look at here is a prisoner suffering for God. He said, for this cause, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So we understand plainly and clearly that at the time of the writing of this epistle, the Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome. Now, Paul wrote four epistles from his imprisonment in Rome. He wrote the uh, book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, and the book of Philemon. And so Paul, those are recognized or talked about or said to be the prison epistles of Paul. Now, at the time of the writing of this epistle, Paul was approximately, approximately 60 years old uh, during this time, give or take a few years. Now, throughout this, throughout this chapter here, this third chapter, Paul is looking upon himself as the minister that the Holy Spirit has appointed 
over this ministry of the gospel. And Paul is a preacher of the gospel. He is a preacher of Jesus Christ. And because of that, Paul is a prisoner suffering because of his preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not suffering because of sin. He is not suffering because uh, of some fear in his life. Paul is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that he is a prisoner of Rome. He doesn't say that he is a prisoner to some vice or something in his life. He doesn't say that he's a prisoner to some type of sin. He said, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. Whose prisoner are you? In other words, what has control of your life? I've never been in prison. I hope I never have to go to prison. I do understand a few things about prison. I understand that they dictate your schedule. I understand that uh, they tell you what you will do and what you won't do, and, and uh, they have you confined to that place. So what has your attention? What has your schedule? What, what, has, what is dictating how you conduct your life or what you do in your life? Paul said that I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's imprisonment for Jesus enabled him to be an ambassador for Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 for just a moment, if you will. Paul's imprisonment for Jesus Christ enabled him to be an ambassador for Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse number 19. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 19. He's talking about prayer. He said, and for me that utterance might be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse number 20, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul didn't allow his current condition of being a prisoner to stop or to hinder his desire for being an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I'm amazed. I, I read the Bible, study about these great men in the Bible and what uh, they were able to do in their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, the obstacles that they had, the difficulty they had, the problems and things that they faced in their life, and yet they were still able to serve and to minister for the Lord. It seems, and I, I, won't, I won't talk about you, I don't know, but it seems that it doesn't take a whole lot to hinder what I need to be doing for the Lord. And yet the Apostle Paul here is in prison. He wrote four epistles uh, from his prison in Rome, and he said that uh, his bonds have given him an opportunity. It's enabled him to be an ambassador for Christ. We know that all of us that are saved, the Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we're to be ministers of Christ, we're to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever, whatever your current situation is, don't allow that current situation or that current problem or that current imprisonment, uh, whatever physically, mentally, whatever the case may be, to render you useless in the army or in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should still be a minister and an ambassador for Christ. Now, hold your place here and look at Philippians for just a moment. Philippians chapter 1. Now, remember, as we look at the book of the Philippians, I said it again. The Philippians. I'm just going to change the name of it, all right? Remember, as we look at the book of Philippians, that the Apostle Paul is, is in prison when he writes this epistle as well, okay? And look what he says here. Uh, he, he said in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 12, But I would you should understand, brethren, now look at this, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. So because of these, this, these things that happened in Paul's life, his arrest, his imprisonment, it has enabled the Apostle Paul to, uh, to witness to and to be a minister to the chief captain that uh, saved him from certain death and also to the mob that tried to kill him in Acts chapter 22. It allowed him to be able to witness to the governor, Festus. It allowed him to be able to witness to the new governor, Felix. It allowed him to be able to witness to King Agrippa. And so these things that had happened to him had fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. 
And so I, I hope I'm, 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 I'm certainly not great at this. I want the things in my life that has caused me difficulty, that caused me problems, that caused me situations. I don't want those things to get me to the place where I want to quit or I want to give up. Now, my flesh does off. The world wants to give in and give out. I want to get to the place spiritually where when those things come, I view them as opportunities to further the gospel and further the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want it to have the kind of effect on me that it had on the Apostle Paul where he said, I want you to understand, brethren, that these things that happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. So tomorrow, maybe even today, this afternoon, maybe something going on in your life, some kind of trouble, some kind of difficulty, some kind of imprisonment, whatever the case may be, tomorrow those situations arise, those troubles come. I think it would do us good if in our mind we would, would seek help from the Lord to allow those situations to cause us to be a better minister, a better witness, a, a better ambassador for the Lord. And so God help us in that situation. When we reach the place where we can view our lives from God's perspective. You see, I, 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 I believe that God is in control. I understand that we are free will agents. We, uh, we do things that we should not do. It's not God's fault. We do things that are right, and we do that not because God made us, but because he loves us and his love compels us to do things for him. I understand all the free will. I know all of that, but I also know that God directs our lives. I believe God has his hand upon our lives. I believe that, uh, that God has uh, uh, knowledge of things that you and I don't know anything about. And sometimes the situation that we're in or the trouble that we're in or the problem that we're in, we might, we might be exactly where God wants us to be at that place in our life so that he can mold us, so that he can make us, so that he can use us, so that he can better prepare us to be used for the Lord. Oftentimes I'm afraid that when these difficulties come, and I, I'm, I'm guilty, I'm preaching to Tim this evening, when these problems come, we want to pray our way out of them or, or we want the Lord to remove them. And I think sometimes that God wants that valley there and God wants that situation there that you will learn to trust him, that you'll learn to pray, that you'll learn to be faithful, that you'll learn to witness, that you'll learn to be an ambassador, that you'll learn to be a minister when things aren't comfortable and when things aren't good and, and when things aren't to your liking, that you will continue to serve God irregardless of the situation. Paul said, I am in prison, I could quit. I'm in prison, I could give up. I'm in prison, I could lay down my pen. I'm in prison, I could close my mouth. I could try to just get along and, and I could try to not cause the upheaval or the uprisal and I could just beg God to get me out of here. But I'm here and since I'm here, I'm going to allow God to use me to follow the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May God help you and I to allow the situations and the circumstances that we're in to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to find Genesis chapter 50 for just a moment. While you turn into Genesis chapter 50, I'm not going to relay the entire story to you, but I want to bring to your remembrance about a man named Joseph. He learned to do through trials in his life. In fact, he went through rejection of his brothers. He went through uh, slavery. He went through being falsely accused and imprisoned again to being second in command under Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And after Joseph was placed in this position of authority, now I'm certain that there were times in Joseph's life leading up to where I'm fixing to read that there were some dark moments. In fact, I'm sure that there were some times when he he, he knew what God had showed him in his dream, but I, I, now I'm not putting words in Joseph's mouth and I'm not trying to bring any discredit to him at all. So I'll say this. If it were me, I, I, would, I, would, I would at some time along the way, I would have probably begun to doubt, you know, maybe, maybe God didn't mean that in his dream. Or maybe, that, maybe I looked at that 
maybe not exactly like God wanted me to see that, and maybe these things are, are, are not going to happen that I thought was going to happen and, and all of that. I, I'm sure that I would. I don't know that Joseph did. I would have went through all of those emotions, all of that second guessing. I would have went through all of that anguish in my mind. And, and yet Joseph went through all of those things, and he comes out in the final chapter of Genesis chapter 50, and look what he said. He's talking to his brethren, the same ones that threw him in the pit, the same ones that sold him into slavery. And he's talking to those brothers, and he says in verse number 19, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. Now look at this. For I am in the place of God. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now, may the Lord help you and I to view our lives the same way that Joseph viewed his. Maybe if we would be able to view our lives from God's purpose or from God's point of view instead of so much for our own. Maybe if we would begin to view our lives from God's direction upon our lives and his care of our lives, maybe it would help us in this prison of life. Now, I want to read you, I want to read you a story, just, just a short one. This, this story was shared in the November 2002 issue of Guidepost magazine, and it's about God's guidance and protection. Uh, Major Michael Halt, Halt's battalion, had been ordered to cross the Kuwait border as part of an Operation Desert Storm. The major was second in command of 130 Marines. The unit had already been under heavy artillery fire and now faced the possibility of oil fires and landmines. Thousands of Iraqi troops waited just beyond the Kuwaiti border. The major prayed, Dear God, help me to lead my troops wisely. Watch over us and keep us safe. As the Marines prepared to cross the next morning, they wrote letters to their loved ones in case they were killed in battle. The next morning before dawn, the order was given to move out. The skies were clear and the men began to advance towards the border. As they advanced, it began to sprinkle and then it began to rain cats and dogs. The rain came down so hard and fast that the men could not make out the desert landscape ahead of them, hindering their advance. This went on for days. The men were not only concerned about the enemy ahead, but now the weather seemed to be against them. Major Hall prayed, Father, please make this rain to stop and protect us. The rain continued to pound the unit until they finally neared the border of Kuwait. At the border, the battalion halted while the enemy waited on the other side. On the day of the invasion, the men woke up to clear skies and sunshine. As they closed in on the border, they could not believe the sight before them. The torrential rains had washed away the sand to reveal, to reveal metal discs planted all across their path. It was an Iraqi minefield. God protected these men and gave them direction by using the storms to uncover the landmines. By the way, he may very well be using the storms in your life to uncover the landmines that lay before you that are dangerous. I, I, what, I, what I was thinking as I was reading this story, how that those Iraqis, they, they don't want anything to do with God. They don't want any, any literature left there. They even tell our military personnel you know, not to leave Bibles and all that stuff. But you can't stop God. It doesn't matter where you are or who you are. What a blessing it is. I, I'm glad I I'm, wasn't part of that battalion. But if I were, I would certainly want a man in charge who knew how to get in touch with God and knew how to pray. But here's what I thought as I was reading that story. Because I know how I am. I could imagine here I am, I'm, I'm in a foreign country, I don't want to be there most likely, I'm in a danger zone, my life is in danger, I've just written a, a letter to my wife, I may not ever make it back, here's my final words, and as I begin that journey, in spite of all the difficulty of life already around, it begins to rain, and it don't just rain, it rains for days. 
So, so now I am, I am I am uncomfortable, I'm miserable, I can't see the enemy, I can't see what's going on. We have a battle ahead, but we're dealing with all these storms and all this rain. I would be complaining, I would be whining, I I, I would hope that I want, but I wouldn't doubt that there weren't many men in these battalions who were whining, complaining about the weather. I would dare say that there were some even cursing God. But while they were doing so, God was removing the very thing that was hiding them from a certain danger. Listen, the storms in your life, the storms in my life, God may have those us in that place while he's doing something that we can't see, something that we don't understand, something that's uncomfortable for us, all the time working it out for our good and our benefit just up ahead. Just keep trusting God, amen. He's a faithful and wonderful Savior. So the minister of the church, he's a prisoner suffering for God. Second of all, he is a privileged servant of God. And verse number two and three talks about the grace that is given him. I'll read verse number one from verse number one again. He said, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you were. First of all, he makes mention at the end of verse number one, prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Paul recognized that all that was taking place in his life was part of God's plan for him to reach the Gentiles. Now, God made him the apostle of the Gentiles, and God gave him the grace to proclaim that ministry. I, 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 you know these verses. I want to look at them anyway. Uh, look, come back, hold your place in Ephesians. Look at Romans, if you will, chapter number 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse number 3. We know that God had made the Apostle Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. Paul said in Romans 11, verse number 13, he said, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the Apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Paul said, I'm making much of my office, God has called me to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So come to 1 Timothy, if you will, chapter 2. 1 Timothy, chapter 2. I'll mention something about that in just a moment. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse number 7. Yeah, I'm going to back up to verse number 5 where the Bible says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Here's the verse, verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. Now notice what he said. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Now look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. This will be the last one we look at. Just talking about just reminding you of the fact that God had called him to be an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher to the Gentiles. I'm glad he did. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse number 11. He says, Word unto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, come back to Ephesians chapter 3. Now, what Paul is saying is simply this. You Gentiles in Ephesus know well that I have received this ministry that I have from the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I have received this ministry on your behalf, the ministry with the message of God and uh, the, the message of God's marvelous grace that salvation is available to whosoever. That includes ye Ephesians. That includes Gentiles. I'm glad that God is able to save anyone and everyone that had come to him. So praise the Lord for this grace that was given to Paul. And Paul, this grace that was given to Paul allowed him to be the minister of Jesus Christ for the Gentiles. So he is a prisoner suffering for God. He is a privileged servant of God. Notice this third thing about him. He is also a praying steward of God. Look what he says in verse number 14. Let me read verse 13 as well. He says, Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. 
So, first of all, we see the power of intercessory prayer. May the Lord help you and I to never forget and to never minimize the importance of prayer. I, I have often said, and I've often had people say this, and, and, and I didn't mean it in any way, derogatory way at all when I said it, and they didn't either. But I've heard this phrase several times, the least I can do is pray for you. Friend, that's the best thing you can do for me. It's certainly not the least thing. And so Paul here, he said, I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the reverence of intercessory prayer. He said, I bow my knees. Now, I understand, and you do as well. The Bible talks about people praying in many positions. I looked that up one time. There are people praying, laying down, standing up, all kinds of positions. So it's not, you don't have to bow your knees to pray. I understand there's some people who's not physically able to even bow on their knees anymore to pray. But I'll tell you what is important. And that is that you humble yourself before God. You, you get to a place of humility and reverence, realizing your, your undeservedness to even call upon God, much less that he would hear you and answer your request. And so there's the reverence of intercessory prayer. Notice the recognition of the prayer. He said, for this calls, I bow my knees unto the Father of Lord Jesus, of whom the whole family, in heaven and earth is name. The whole family. Well, whether you like it or not, all of us that are saved are part of the very same family. And I sure hope we're involved in praying for each other. So Paul, Paul said I, uh, there was a humble rec uh, reverence, intercession. There was a recognition of intercessory prayer. Listen, if you, if you see something in someone's life that you disagree with, pray for them. If you see something in someone's life that you like and you agree with, pray for them. Amen. And so may God just help us to pray one for another. And uh, while, while you're praying for them, remember that they have probably seen some things in you that they don't like. And wouldn't you want them to be praying for you? Or maybe they see some things in you that they do like. Don't you want them to pray for you that God would give you the strength to continue doing those things that are a blessing and pleasing to the Lord? And so God help us to pray for each other. So we see this Paul's praying, his position, his intercessory prayer, his recognition, his humility, his desire to pray for everyone. But I think, I think one thing... Maybe we don't see in the context, but in the overall picture, we can certainly understand. I think Paul's suffering drove him to his knees. Now, I, I, I'm sorry to admit this, but sometimes I don't pray as faithfully as I should. I don't pray as earnestly as I should. But boy, when trouble comes, boy, when problems come, when trials come, when situations come, it, it'll put you on your knees before God. It'll put you on your face before the Lord. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if in our lives we had such a, such a prayer life that our life would not be our prayer life? Now, let me see if I can word this so that it makes sense. I, wouldn't it be a blessing if our prayer life was so that problems and difficulties didn't affect our prayer life. What I mean for that is there was no way we could pray any more earnest. There's no way we could pray any more sincere. There's no more we could pray any more frequently than we already were. It shouldn't be that problems and trouble is what drives us to pray. We ought to pray because we believe God is able to hear and answer in our prayer. Now, God may allow trials and desperation in our life to develop our prayer life. And if he does, praise the Lord for it. He may be using those trials to develop your humility. He may be using those trials to develop your dependency upon him. But whatever it is, just trust him. Now let's look at one more thing, and we'll stop for this evening. So we see the minister of Christ. He is a prisoner suffering for God. He's a privileged servant of God. He's a praying steward of God, but he's also a properly equipped servant of God. Look at verses 7 and 8. In verse number 7, he said, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me 
by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, he may mention here a gift given by God. Paul didn't decide to pick up preaching as a vocation. He didn't just decide to become a preacher because his friends and family thought he would make a good preacher. Paul was given the grace to be God's minister. Now, he, he was a humble servant, I'll say that. The, the Bible said here in, in verse number 8, he said, Unto me who am the least of all saints is this grace given. Now, with, with that thought of mine, let, let's see something right, right fast before we look at that. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for just a second. Now, I'll, and I'll show you this as I go through this. Paul's, I, I, I have a problem and, I, and it's not that I know any personal fellowship with any, but I struggle with, with preachers and men in the ministry who become prideful. Well, see, I'll, I'll show you through the scripture that Paul, Paul became more and more humble as he went along in the ministry. Look, 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 look what the Bible says. Let me show you this. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse number 8. In verse, in verse 15, verse number 8, he said, I'm the least of all the apostles. Look what he said. First Corinthians 15, 5. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. I'm reading, I'm not reading right. Let's see. Verse number 9. Yeah. For I am the, just keep reading to him. For I am the least of the apostles. That I'm not me to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul started in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and he said, I'm the least of all the apostles. Now, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. A little later on, Paul made the statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 11. Though I be nothing. Look what he said. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 11. He said, I am become a fool in glory. You have compelled me, if I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles. Look what he says. Though I be nothing. He said, first of all, I am the least of the apostles. Then he said, I am nothing. In our text verse, in Ephesians chapter 3, and verse number 8, he said, I am the least of all the saints. Now, look at, look at this one more time. Look, Look in 2 Timothy, Timothy, or 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter, uh, no, 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 1, one yeah. Look, Look at 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 1, in verse, verse number 15, Paul said, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came in order to save sinners. Look what he said, of whom I am chief. And so the longer that Paul was in the ministry, the more humble he became towards the, uh, towards the things of God. He was a humble servant. Now, in spite of all this, you're still there in 1 Timothy. I want to show you something I've already left there. In 1 Timothy, stay there. In spite of all this, in spite of all these things, Paul said, Paul said, I'm the least of all the saints. I'm the least of the apostles. I'm nothing. I'm the chiefest of sinners. But in spite of all that, the Apostle Paul counted, I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ counted the Apostle Paul faithful, putting him in the ministry. Look at verse number 12, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who is before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. What a blessing that in spite of, all, in spite of our lives, God can count us faithful, putting us into the ministry. With that thought in mind, putting us in the ministry, come to Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians is right before Ephesians. Galatians chapter 1. Paul said, he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse 15. Paul said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb 
and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, if we read on in that passage, and, and maybe we should, look at, look, well, let's do that. Look at verse 17. He said, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and, and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. And so he said in, in verse number 15 that he was called by God's grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, he said he went three years. He didn't, he didn't confer with men. He didn't go up to Jerusalem. He went into Arabia, went into the desert, and he stayed there three years getting an education from God. And he came back and began to proclaim the truth that God had gave him. Oliver B. Green said this. I think it bears repeating. He said today some young men go to theological schools because their loved ones tell them they would make a good preacher. Some young men go to theological institutions to learn how to preach. God have mercy on this poor, ignorant age in which we live. God's ministers are called of God, ordained of God, commissioned of God, sent by God, and their message is from God. Paul was God's minister. Paul said that the Lord counted him faithful, putting him in the ministry. I want to ask you something. I'm, I'm done. I'm closing right here. Can God count you faithful to do anything for him? Can God count you faithful to put you into something to work for him, to serve him, to minister for him, to do something for him? I want to be counted. And by the way, I don't have time to develop this. I don't, even, I don't have a verse for that. It just came to mind. The Lord saw that Paul was faithful before his conversion on the road. We need, we need some faithful people. Amen. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for putting the Apostle Paul into the ministry. Thank you for his faithful 